What is a Chinese person? <laughs> Where could they possibly come from? Am I Chinese? Well, by the end of this, we'll find out. I can tell you now, no. <laughs> if you're listening to this, you're probably not Chinese. And that's my Chinese Jeff Foxworthy routine. <laughs> you know you're Chinese when you're from China. When all the other members of your family are Chinese. <laughs> when you have a last name that's might be Wong, might be something like that. You might be Chinese, I'm just saying. Pretty racy stuff. Factual, but racy. So the first Chinese people came to California when the gold rush happened in 1848. They called this general area of the U.S. Gum San, which means gold mountain. Oh, okay. That's just the first of many words in Chinese that we're going to offensively mispronounce yet again. I really wish that they kept that name and we lived at Gold Mountain. Or Gumsan. Or Gumsan. You ever chewed Gumsan? Mm. Their plan was to come to the country, strike it rich in gold, and then bring all the money back home. Problem was, not that many people actually struck it very rich in the gold rush, mm -hmm. especially not Chinese people, because once the amount of gold being found started to dwindle, the U.S. government wanted to keep the money in the family. So in 1850, they instigated the foreign miners tax, which made non-U.S. citizens pay $20 a month, which is about $500 in today's oh dollars, to just to dig. Dig it. Dig it, man. Dig it, man. Well, don't if you're Chinese. Because <laughs> it's a lot of money. People were pretty quick to get them to stop that tax because it's ridiculous and people just didn't care if foreigners were finding gold. I have a feeling that's not true. Well, it, they just didn't want Chinese people finding gold. Oh, okay. So in 1852, another law came out that made only Chinese miners oh my God. have to pay $2 that's a month ridiculous. in order to dig. Wait until you hear what happens to the Chinese people. We should focus all our racism. I'm tired of spreading it around. We should focus on one group of people. <laughs> Things only got worse from there for the Chinese. And here it comes. Oh, boy. <laughs> this is basically just, my Kevlar on. Yeah, this is just a laundry list of how Chinese people were mistreated. So the Chinese population in California was centered around San Francisco because it was much closer to the gold rush action. But some of them started to make their way south. So the first census that came out after California became a state in 1850 showed that there were two Chinese people living in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. two house servants named Ah Fu. When you tracked it down, two people, that's pretty remarkable. And Ah Loose. Mm -hmm. I am remarkable. <laughs> So the, marked on that. <laughs> the Chinese people that came to L.A. in the early days, they usually didn't come straight from China. The people that were coming to L.A. were coming from other parts of California. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of movement between the Chinese in L.A. and San Francisco. By 1859, there were Chinese fishermen working off of Catalina Island. The 1860 census showed 14 Chinese people living in L.A. And in the 1870 census, out of the 5,723 residents in L.A., 234 of them were Chinese. Half of these people lived on a street called, here we go. Oh, this, I've been waiting a month to hear this. <laughs> I've been working up the courage to pronounce this. Oh, boy. Calle de los Negros, which... Yes. At this time was turning out to be the epicenter of what was turning into something of a Chinatown. So now let's talk about this horribly offensive street for a little <laughs> bit. It was between El Pueblo Plaza and Old Arcadia Street, which is that alley that's next to the old firehouse that's oh, there. Okay, yeah. Calle de los Negros. The people who spoke English in town would refer to it as N-word alley. Oh, okay. Only they did not pronounce it as politely as that. <laughs> It, wow, that's uh, that's vicious. Uh, it's absolutely dirty and horrible. <laughs> it was called such not because black people lived there, but because the Spanish people who lived there had darker skin than the other Spanish people that's living elsewhere lazy. in the city. Yeah, that is lazy <laughs> on the part of racists. Oh, of you're the saying day. Spanish people are lazy? <laughs> <laughs> The calle, which is what I'm going to call it from now on, because I cannot, That's... I need to take four showers when I get home tonight. But it's not real, man. <laughs> the calle was no longer than 500 feet and no wider than 50 feet. But between 1850 and 1856, it was the most dangerous place in the country. They called it the wickedest street on earth. Ooh. It stung the nostrils of all decent people. It was lined up and down with saloons and dives and brothels. In 1853, the average violent death rate in LA was one death per day and all of this emanated from the calle. Oh my god, it was like execution alley. <laughs> in March of 1855 there were five homicides in 24 hours on the calle but the victims were of a class that could well be spared so the city never Ooh. really did much to clean it up. Yeah, I don't like the way that was phrased but it was quite eloquent. Hey, I didn't phrase it this way. <laughs> Talk to my lawyer. Okay. <laughs> Kurt? <laughs> yeah. Kurt Calle. 
So in 1877, the city finally renamed it Los Angeles Street. Oh. Uh, yeah, Los Angeles, as you know and love. As I Los love Angeles, to park on, yeah. yeah. So this was where the city's first Chinatown started. It was a Chinatown, but a lot of Mexican and Japanese people lived there too. After the gold rush, a lot of Chinese people started working on the railroads all the live long day, where they were given the most dangerous jobs, such as placing dynamite. Oh, wow. <laughs> but once the transcontinental railroads were finished in 1869, they needed to find new work. So this started the focus on the Sai Dai Quen or the four big businesses. The first big business was the laundry business. Mm -hmm. During the gold rush, there were so few women around that were running laundries, which made the laundry prices so expensive that it was cheaper to ship the dirty laundry from California to Hawaii, (laughs) and sometimes even to China itself, and have it done there and sent back. So the Chinese people in California apparently were the only ones who saw how ridiculous this was. <laughs> so they took it as an opportunity. And since it was very inexpensive to start a laundry business, because all you really had to buy was soap and they could do it out of their own homes, they started doing this. So wow. they were extremely successful businesses and the city hated them for it. So in 1872, LA passed a $5 tax on laundry businesses. Awesome. So there were 15 Chinese laundries at the time and most of them refused to pay. So they were arrested and chose <laughs> the alternate option of five days in jail. But that didn't stop them at all. That didn't stop those Chinese. The peak of the Chinese laundry boom was in 1890 with 52 Chinese run laundries that employed a total of 500 Chinese people. The second big business was agriculture. Many of the early Chinese to come to California were from the Xi Yup province Mm -hmm. where a lot of people were farmers and by coincidence the climate was similar to that of LA so it was an easy choice to get some agriculture going. So there were Chinese vegetable farms in Watts, Linwood, Compton, Wilmington, and San Pedro. Most of the selling was originally done out of carts around the Olvera Street Plaza and at the horse stables that they had down by the LA riverbed. And by the 1870s they were the dominant vegetable sellers in town. So if you wanted to eat your vegetables you had to come through the Chinese. And nobody wanted (laughs) Too. <laughs> Little boys are running away. <laughs> the original reprimand to children was eat your vegetables, support the Chinese. <laughs> there was pins made. But they were pins of Brussels sprouts. <laughs> you had to eat the pins. There were stronger people back then. <laughs> Every kid was a little tougher than they are now. Made sandpaper. Go ahead. So yet again, the Chinese were getting too successful for LA's liking. So in 1878, the city tried to pass laws to get Chinese vegetable sellers to buy permits, but the vendors striked. And since the city was so dependent on the Chinese for getting their vegetables, the city was forced to back down. The Chinese vegetable sellers showed their might again in 1886 when the LA Trades and Labor Council started an anti-Chinese boycott, but the vegetable sellers counter boycotted and stopped providing the city with vegetables Ooh. and forced that racist union to back down. Well, chi- yeah, children <laughs> everywhere rejoiced. <laughs> in 1880, out of the 60 registered vegetable sellers in the city, 50 of them were Chinese. Wow. By 1894, there were 104 licensed Chinese vegetable sellers. And by 1900, a fourth of all Chinese men in the city were working in agriculture. So in response to the city growing and people needing designated spaces where they could get all their goods, the Hughes market was old opened up in 1901 at 9th in Los Angeles. I just realized, is that Hughes, like the old soup? Do you think that's connected to the old supermarket? I was just thinking the same thing. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of the logo in my head. It's a cartoon of a Chinese person holding a vegetable. Do you think that's connected? It can't be. No, impossible. There's no connection there. It's also called the Ralph's market now. But first it was the Howe's market for a little bit. Is it Hughes? Hughes, like Howard Hughes. Market. How do you market? <laughs> it's mostly just pee <laughs> in a jar. Pee and fingernails. <laughs> it, could, it could be connected. It might be. Uh, well, bonus, bonus episode. episode. Oh, <laughs> Jinx, you owe me a bonus episode. <laughs> I'll just step outside and work on a bonus episode. You wrap this up. So it was so successful, this market, Howard Hughes Vegetable mar- Market, it was so successful that it kept growing and a separate market dedicated completely to just the vegetables was opened in 1903 called the Los Angeles Market Company at 3rd and Central. Is that the Los Angeles market? (laughs) So things were going well for a while, but in 1909, there was a dispute between the vendors and the people who owned the market. So the place splintered into two different markets. There was the new Los Angeles Market Company on 6th and Alameda, and then City Market on 9th and San Pedro. Sold. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, it's a market. So City Market... (laughs) Idiot. 
What did that even mean? God, you're dumb. So City Market was started by a Chinese American named Louis Kwan, but it was a place not just for Chinese vendors, but also for white vendors and Japanese vendors. It opened on April 3rd, 1909, and as many of the workers there were Chinese, grocery stores started to spring up around that area that were catering to what Chinese people liked. Mm -hmm. So this started to draw people who were living in Chinatown, but worked at City Market to move to this area. And effectively, it created a sort of second smaller Chinatown in the nearby area and stretching into the East Adams area. It was more of a Chinese suburb as opposed to the urban squalor that was Chinatown. (laughs) Some families, they even had their own houses as opposed to the multifamily tenements or Bao Wong Lo that people were living in in real Chinatown. It was like a Springfield shell rivalry between the two places. <laughs> what a perfect way to put it. <laughs> so they had sports teams that would play against each other, like the Guardsmen and the Wakus and a cafe team, during which games people would uh, watch and yell racial slurs okay. at the players, of course. My favorite kind of games is where I can go and just yell that at people. <laughs> you know That's what I the really game. Bet. So City Market got so successful that it grew three blocks to the south up towards 12th Street and one block west stretching to Wall Street. So it did so well that the white shareholders in that market knew that they wouldn't be able to force out the Asians that they had planned to do for so long. So many of the white shareholders pulled out and went to the much whiter honky-tonk Los Angeles market company. Boring. Which put the city market in a serious spot where they needed to come up with $70,000 to keep them open. Sounds Sounds like a movie I'd watch. Wait till you hear, this is the best part of the whole story. They were saved at the last moment by the Asparagus Association. (laughs) The AA? (laughs) Yet again, another another last minute salvation by the Asparagus Association. I think I came to the wrong AA. (laughs) It's not what I was thinking it was. Asparagus Association. They they had their own association. Yeah, they got a whole 12-step program. (laughs) 12 step to the perfect uh, casserole. The third step is salt. The Chinese workers at the market had tough lives. They would wake up at 2 a.m. and then work 18-hour days. So stop complaining. They're, yeah, you, (laughs) listener. I see what you're doing. You think you're tired listening to this? Imagine being Chinese. Imagine being Chinese and having to listen to this. So their main competition in the vegetable game were the Japanese, who were equally adept at farming. The best thing to happen to the Chinese vegetable sellers was Executive Order 9066 on February 19th, 1942, when all the Japanese, in in case you forgot, when all the Japanese in the city got shipped off to Santa Anita Racetrack and the Tuna Can Camp, uh, refer to episode monsters. (laughs) All of a sudden, the Chinese had no vegetable competition, so things were good for the Chinese. On the other hand, this was arguably the worst thing ever to happen to Japanese (laughs) vegetable sellers. It was a time of great prosperity for the Chinese vegetable sellers, and they, along with the white farmers, were buying up all the abandoned Japanese land. So the city market Chinese community, it lasted a while, but once the Chinese population started to move around later on, and the Japanese came back after the war, the Chinese community there started to disperse, and by 1952, there were only 25 Chinese families left in that area. So the market itself is no longer there, but there's a lot of fabric and flower markets in the area. Mm -hmm. But if you sniff really hard, you can still smell bok choy. God, I don't like you. (laughs) What's that smell? I broke my nose trying to smell. Okay, so now back to the big four businesses. Third big business, restaurants. I thought you were going to say wrestling. Restaurants? The fourth one is wrestling. Thanks for spoiling (laughs) it. We'll get to it. I like Chinese food. You like Chinese food. It's okay. Everyone. <laughs> All right. So there's three big businesses. <laughs> According to Greg, there's three big businesses. A lot of Chinese restaurants opened up to cater to people's curiosity of mm-hmm. what were Chinese people eating. The fourth big business satisfied an even greater curiosity gambling. So Chinatown was full of gambling houses. And if you give a town a place to gamble, they're probably going to ask for an opium den. (laughs) And while you're at it, throw in some saloons. So Chinatown became LA's red light district. It contained a third of all the city's saloons were in Chinatown. White people were repulsed by the squalor of Chinatown, but it was where they went when they wanted pleasure. Because if you're going to dig into your vice, you want to go somewhere really seedy to do it. Not in my backyard your backyard. (laughs) So the central avenue of all this sinfulness was called Sanchez Street, which was one block west of the Calle. This was the place to get Chinese prostitutes. (laughs) Oh, did I mention they had prostitutes? No, but you kind of figured. Many of them. Yeah, come on. You're doing opium. They go hand in hand. Literally. Yeah, because you 
you gotta hold their hands. So prostitution was a big thing. Eventually the city banned it in 1909, but not in Chinatown. Anything goes. Chinatown was mostly a bachelor community because most of the original immigrants from China were men. The first Chinese woman came to LA in 1859. But and not- she married everybody. <laughs> she was the Chinese woman. <laughs> not many women followed her. A Chinese woman was a rare sight if you saw one in Chinatown. And it was probably best that way because most of the women who did come over didn't so much come over as were kidnapped. <laughs> So the early Chinese women in LA had mostly either been kidnapped or otherwise tricked into coming. And once they arrived, they were sold as slaves or indentured sex servants for terms that could last four years. And the local police would help this human trafficking because they knew that people liked it and they were customers. (laughs) And they were monsters. If one of the women would escape, the young LAPD and other (laughs) men of the law would track her down and collect the reward that was offered for her freedom. So in 1875, the U.S. tried to put a stop to this behavior with the Page Act, which made it illegal to bring Chinese women into the country for the purpose of prostitution or slaves or anything like that. That wasn't a law already? No, why would it be? (laughs) What do you mean? Why would Chinese women have rights prior to 1875? That just doesn't make sense. It's uh, nonsensical. So with this, though, it kind of spread to basically no Chinese women allowed, which led to there being even more single Chinese men that actually encouraged prostitution further. So not all the Chinese were working these low-level jobs like this. No offense to farmers, laundry people, restaurateurs, and prostitutes in the 1800s. Some of the city's Chinese residents were attorneys. Some of them were dentists and doctors. Some, of course, worked in... Hollywood <laughs> show business, Greg. The show business. The show me business. Show me the money. Show. God damn it. Business. <laughs> so even if the people of LA as a whole didn't like Chinese culture, Hollywood did. Yeah. Prime example: the Chinese theater, which uh, oh, at, I never thought about that. at long last is now finally owned by Chinese people. <laughs> it's funny comedy, <laughs> humor, irreverent, edgy, sensual, offensive, canceled. <laughs> Rebooted (laughs) by a dragon. (laughs) So in most of the early movies, Chinese characters would, for the most part, be played by white actors in yellow face. But there were a few Chinese actors who were able to break through. People like Chai Hong, who started out as a bellhop as the Alexandria Hotel, which is still there downtown. We Mm -hmm. like to look at that sometimes. And became an actor many referred to as the Celestial Comedian or the Chinese Chaplain. Mm -hmm. He had recurring roles as a character named Charlie, who looked a lot like Charlie Chaplin. (laughs) Uh, Another guy, James Wong Howe. You know him. Yeah. Yeah, he's Famous, you should. Uh, I know him. I know him before. He was an actor? I thought he was a cinematographer. No, no, no. He was a cinematographer. You're right. And he also owned the Ching Hao restaurant at 11386 Ventura Boulevard in North Hollywood, because I guess he didn't make enough money from (laughs) cinematography, even though he was nominated for 10 Oscars and he won twice. The first Chinese vaudeville performer was Li Tung Fu, who would tour the country and would sing opera solos and do Scottish accents. Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. I, gotta I would love it. to see that. There were a bunch of Chinese actors who got work in the Charlie Chan movies, mm-hmm. but the most important one to us in LA was Anna Mae Wong. Ooh. Not Anna Mae Wong. Anna Mae Wong. Three words. Yeah. What are names? Well, no, it's one word. Anna Mae Wong. Anna Mae Wong. She was born Wong Liu Song on January 3rd, 1905 on Flower Street in our very city, mm-hmm. Baltimore. She grew up in Chinatown and would see the film crews shooting movies on Marsha Salt Street, which is right near the laundry that her parents owned, and she decided that she wanted to act. So she would beg the film crews for parts in the movies, so much that they eventually referred to her as CCC, or Curious Chinese Child. Wow. They loved alliteration. They loved it. And racism. Couldn't get enough of it. Eventually, she did get to act in several movies. In 1921, she was in Bits of Life, co-starring with Lon Chaney Sr. Connections. So in 1922, she got a starring role in The Troll of the Sea, which was the first color feature made in Hollywood, and she was the star of it. In 1924, she was in The Thief of Baghdad with Douglas Fairbanks, the husband of Mary Pickford, and she became an international star. Not Mary Pickford, but her also. (laughs) Anna Mae Wong was the most famous Asian actor outside of Asia. In 1927, she was at the groundbreaking ceremony of the Chinese theater along with Charlie Chaplin himself. She put the first rivet 
in the structure, really, in the ground. That's amazing. So, so unfortunately, Hollywood was set on making Chinese characters in movies usually be evil villains or otherwise some sort of helpless idiot. So she was starting to get typecast, which she hated. So in 1928, she moved to Europe to do some acting there. But then Hollywood started to promise her better things, a la F. Scott Fitzgerald and <laughs> William Faulkner. So in 1930, she moved back to L.A., but those parts never came. Boy. She was in Shanghai Express with mm-hmm. Marlene Dietrich yeah. in 1932. But in 1935, when MGM was making The Good Earth, they chose a white actor in yellow face over her, the most famous Chinese actor in town. (laughs) Paul Moody. (laughs) Not the comedian. (laughs) She spent most of the rest of her life fighting for positive portrayals of Chinese people in movies, which never really panned out even to this day. She herself appeared in 72 movies and TV shows, and she died February 2nd, 1961 in Santa Monica. The reason for the negative portrayals of Chinese people in movies, you ask? 99% 99% racism. Okay. That's your answer. Thanks. I was. What's the 1%? Financial reasons. <laughs> they can't back them. No. Because of the racism, though, so it's really 100%. When the Chinese people first came to California, people really didn't have a fundamental problem with them. It was a sudden shift when in the 1860s, an anti-Chinese sentiment was cultivated by politicians and labor unions telling people to hate the Chinese. Why did they do this? because Chinese people were willing to work long hours for low pay and the people in charge who had the job security of white people in mind did not like that. Does that sound familiar to you? (laughs) They took all the dirty jobs that white people didn't want to do and they looked down on them for that. They were accused of stealing jobs from the whites. People hated them because they wouldn't assimilate, but how could they when they were being treated so horribly by the people that they were supposed to be acting like? They were blamed for other people's economic problems. They saw the Chinese gangsters, who I'll get to soon, as representative of all Chinese people, so they lumped regular people in with these low lives. A lot of it had to do with nativism also, which is absurd since the rest of them got there just a few years earlier. (laughs) Also, the Chinese population kept growing and people started to worry that eventually there'd be so many of them that they'd elect a Chinese governor. Could you imagine? What's next? Racial stuff to come out of Greg's mouth? (laughs) What's next? The dragon hosting a podcast? (laughs) And with all the gambling and the horse stables that were down there, the city segregated the area even further. All of this led to a neglect for Chinatown itself. The city didn't get around to giving it basic services like plumbing and proper street lighting for years. The streets of Chinatown didn't get paved until 1930. The Chinese weren't allowed to own property either. So the residents of the buildings that they were living in, like I said, they're tenements basically. Mm -hmm. They were not in charge of maintaining them. So they started to decay and the whole area started to look run down. Chinatown was a ghetto basically. And the Chinese people were constantly being attacked. They were being harassed. Some Christian organizations saw this as an opportunity to swoop in and try to convert the... Uh. This is a quote. This is a quote. They were trying to convert the heathen Chinese. Someone cut them off from talking? You didn't pronounce the last two letters back then. That's the if word it was part. a minority, that was you wouldn't the- pronounce the last two letters. It's okay. <laughs> One such attempt was featured in the drawing on the cover of Harper's Weekly in 1894, a drawing of a uh, like pastor singing in the streets in Chinatown. So on the plus side, the missionaries did help teach people English, but with things being as bad as they were, the community, the Chinese community had to look to themselves for protection because there was safety in ethnic community. Yeah. They helped the people who just got in from China to get used to life in America. During the Depression, the Chinese at City Market were hit really hard, so the community there would pool its money into what was called a hui, and they would give it out to whatever families were struggling oh, at the wow. time. There were various organizations that were formed to help each other out, like the Wai Lung Kung Sa in 1890, and eventually all these separate organizations were united under the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. CBA. Did you just say Curious Chinese? <laughs> Curious Chinese Benevolent Association. <laughs> so they set up special schools for mm-hmm. Chinese children to go to after their regular school. By 1922, five of these such schools existed. Another sort of organization organization that existed were called Tongs. What's Tongs? Here we go. They were sort of community organizations. They were sort of brotherhoods. They were sort of gangs. Like a moose lodge? It's kind of like a moose lodge, but with like butterfly knives. And <laughs> they lot. sound really nice, butterfly <laughs> knives. Really painful. You try feeding them and... 
What are we talking about? He just got to go to the hospital after. <laughs> they got a bite. Are we still talking about dragons? Only dragons. This whole th- I blanked out. Here be dragons. So the Tongs looked out for the interests of different Chinese families and businesses. They apparently had close ties to the LAPD also, who allowed them to run the Chinese jail on Appa Blasa Street and use it to punish Tong members as they saw fit. Oh boy. Unfortunately, separate Tongs sometimes... Tongers. Separate, separate measures. <laughs> separate tongs sometimes came into conflict with each other. So, there was a woman named Yat Ho, who had been a married woman in China. She was kidnapped and sold as an indentured sex servant to LA. So, on October 24th, 1871, Yat Ho's brother arrived in Chinatown from China, having been sent by the tong that she had belonged to to free her from this rival tong. He confronted a member of the rival tong on the Kaye, and a gunfight ensued. So, Yat Ho's brother chased the guy into the Coronel building building, and then he was shot. So responding to the gunshots was an LAPD officer named Jesus Bilderain, who got to the scene to find Yut Ho's brother dead on the ground and another gunman hiding out in this building. So Bilderain shot into the building, and his fire was returned, and he himself got shot, so he called out for help. Responding to the call was a white guy named Robert Thompson, who quickly got himself shot oh my God. <laughs> in the chest, and he died a slow death over the next hour. And this is when it all started. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't... Oh, no. This is the tip of the racist iceberg. Oh, let's hear it. Okay, so words... My favorite kind of iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> the kind that sunk the uh, Chinese Titanic. Word started to spread throughout the crowd that had gathered to watch what was happening. And a guy die for over an hour? Yeah, look at him go. <laughs> well, and he's really going. So the word was spreading that the Chinese were attacking whites. They were killing the white man by wholesale. Whoa. whoa. Like Costco. <laughs> So slowly, a mob started to grow. Now, at the time, the LAPD only had six officers. Not all of them were on duty today, and one of them was already down. <laughs> That's <laughs> five phone calls. You can't, you can't call a cop off duty. It's in their union. You also can't be Chinese. A second cop showed up on the scene named Marshall Francis Baker, who deputized a bunch of the men at random from the crowd, wow. assigned them to surround the Coronel building to make sure the suspect didn't get away. Then he went home and let them deal with it. Oh my. Hey, here's a gun. You're responsible, right? You look like an honest guy. Yeah, they got Otis and <laughs> Floyd the Barber deputized. To shoot till something starts bleeding and then go home. <laughs> so then two other officers on the scene were George Gard and Emil Harris. Harris was actually one of the guys that went on to help capture Tiburcio Vasquez oh, three really? years later. This is his training. Connection, yeah. Uh, qu- some training. Unfortunately, he wasn't much of a cop at this point, so the both of them just stood by and watched the mob grow over the course of three hours until it grew to 500 people of all social statuses and races, they put aside all their differences for just one night so that they could murder Chinese people. (laughs) And 500 people at the time That was a tenth of the entire population of the city came out. There were half-hearted attempts to disperse the crowd, but the people, they were just whipped into such a frenzy because of their open racism and because of what had just happened that they just wanted to kill Chinese people. They wanted any Chinese people will do. (laughs) So I don't know what set them off, but the mob unleashed. They climbed onto the roofs of buildings and they ripped them open with axes. Every single home and business on the Kaye was looted. Some Chinese people were shot straight up. Others were lynched on anything that they could find archways, gateways, wagons that they turned upside down. Adults and children were killed. One of the victims was the local doctor, whose name ironically was Chin Li Tong. That's probably why I went after him. (laughs) You! We don't know what that word means. You're dead. This guy, he pleaded for his life in English and Spanish. He said he would pay them if they stopped. He offered his diamond wedding ring to get them to stop. They didn't listen. They lynched him cut off his ears as souvenirs and then cut off his finger and took the ring you know what what you know what the citizens were doing while all this was happening no what cheering they were standing on the sidelines cheering some of these people were prominent members of society who went on to hold political offices years later (laughs) not everybody was horrible though a guy named robert whitney who was a former teacher who helped found usc heard what was happening he went to the scene of the mob he would grab members of the mob put a gun to their throat and say get out or i'll kill you so he got he got some people to leave wasn't enough (laughs) eventually sheriff james burns stopped the madness and then the mob went drinking in the saloons 
He must have clocked in first. <laughs> All right, it's 11 o'clock <laughs> on duty. God, I hate my job. <laughs> so the morning after the massacre, there were two rows of Chinese corpses lined up in front of the jailhouse. Between 17 and 22 Chinese people were killed, but the number I heard most often was 19. This was the largest mass lynching in American history. To add to that list of proud achievements for the city, it was also the first time LA as a city got any national attention. <laughs> The story was on the front pages of the real cities in the East who were appalled by what was happening God, in L.A. So. It was bigger news than the Chicago fire, which happened the same year. The Chinese government was not happy at all with the U.S. for letting this happen to their people. The city of L.A. decried the citizens for doing this and the law enforcement for not protecting its citizens. But the best part about all this... Nobody was punished. Huh. Most of the witnesses they called on claimed that they couldn't recall any members of the mob. They didn't, like, they don't re I don't remember any faces. It was a blur. Yeah, a big blur in the form of a murderous mob. Even better, Chinese people, much like the Native Americans, were not allowed to testify against white people, so their testimonies didn't matter. <sighs> Eventually, a man named Cameron Erskine Tom, who was a friend of Thomas Jefferson and a soldier in the Confederate Army oh, boy. and future 16th mayor of L.A., a <laughs> decade <laughs> <laughs> a decade later, he managed to get 24 members of the mob accused of murder. Really? Conveniently, none of them were the higher-ups in society who were involved in this. Yeah. The trial began in March 1872. The defense was led by a man named Edward J.C. Kewin. He was a very expensive lawyer who was probably paid for by the high society members who had been part of the mob and made the other people take the fall for them. Another Confederate man. He, had been, he was imprisoned in Alcatraz during the Civil War for trying to get California to secede from the union you know when people say they have like city pride uh, stuff like this is going to come to mind a long line of confederates <laughs> so it was hard to find any jury members also because so many people in la were part of vigilance committees which were the groups that would start lynch mobs <laughs> And also, a tenth of the population was involved in this. Yeah. An even bigger conflict of interest, the judge was Robert Whitney, who was the guy who was going around with oh, a gun trying to disperse Lord. the mob. So an even bigger, bigger conflict this of interest. This is an interest. episode of Andy Griffith. <laughs> Get this. The judge didn't technically have his judging license. God damn it. God damn it. God damn it. Really? I just have this robe and this. Does anybody have a gavel? For the love of God. Ten of the guys got convicted of manslaughter, and a few of them spent some time in San Quentin, but through some legal trickery by the defense, the case then went to the Supreme Court of California, and all charges were dropped, and the case died forever. Also dead forever, the 19 innocent <laughs> Chinese people who were murdered. This was the last lynching in LA's disgusting history. These people, they got away with treating Chinese people like this, because there was nobody, there was nobody around who wasn't Chinese that was saying, this is wrong. Yeah. They were made to feel like it was okay to kill Chinese people because they're Chinese people, their Chinese lives don't matter. So what? what's the big deal? So this incident is not very well known because LA at the time was trying to get a nice reputation and they were trying to attract more white people to come move here so they swept this under the rug as quickly as they could. History tried to forget it because it's just so shameful <laughs> and it's completely unforgivable. So let this be your friendly reminder from LA Meekly. We're disgusting. <laughs> There's a plaque on the sidewalk in front of the Chinese American Museum that tells the spot of where this massacre happened. Really? And things did not get better from here for the Chinese. <laughs> here we go. Let's Buckle up. Click. Hold on to your... Click. My buckle. <laughs> Hold on to my what? Your red envelopes from Chinese New Year. So 1882 brought with it the Chinese Exclusion Act, which forbid Chinese immigration and prevented the ones already here from becoming citizens. Awesome. This was the first law in U.S. history excluding an ethnicity of immigrants from entering the country. <laughs> As a result, local business owners in L.A. refused to hire Chinese workers. Then in 1892 came the Geary Act, which took the Exclusion Act and went a little bit further what? and required Chinese people to register themselves for oh, a permit to be in the country, which they would have to have on them at all times or else they would be deported. And in 1893, the first Chinese person was deported by this law right here in LA. So in 1913, then the California alien land law was passed. <laughs> to prevent immigrants ineligible for citizenship from owning land. Problem is, the Chinese were already made ineligible for citizenship by the Chinese Exclusion Act, so now they were also not allowed to own land. They're just making up laws left and right. What, what else can we take away from this? <laughs> what else could possibly happen to the Chinese people? Let me ask it. What else can possibly happen to the Chinese people? Nothing, they're fine. <laughs> November 6th. 
boy. 1885. Oh, I hate when you give specific dates. That means something bad's going to happen. <laughs> the little old community of Pasadena. Some oh. white people went out one night and they started throwing rocks through the window of a Chinese laundry. Of course. It's just another November night. <laughs> so one of the rocks hit a lamp, which fell over and caught the building on fire. The Chinese people living in the building ran away while the white people proceeded to loot it and then chase the Chinese people. So the next day, the lovely people of Pasadena were angry with the Chinese for the fire, and they hanged an effigy of a Chinese person on the ashes of the burnt buildings. They were then given 24 hours to leave Pasadena, and more than 100 Chinese people were forced to leave downtown Pasadena and resettle to the area south of California Street and east of Fair Oaks. What else? Yes, what else? Oh, in both 1886 and 1887, large parts of Chinatown were burned down by arsonists. The arsonists were never punished, and the Chinese people whose lives were destroyed got no insurance money. Despite literally everything going against them, though, the Chinese people still managed to thrive. Chinese culture was novel enough that Chinatown became a tourist destination. The herbalist services were very popular amongst the non-Chinese. In the late 1800s, they started to be invited to participate in the Fiesta de Los Angeles parade. In 1895, they were allowed to have public celebrations of the Chinese New Year with dragons. In 1898, a reverend named Ng Poon Chu, a.k.a. Wu Pan Zo, Ooh, like you might that. know him as that, started the Wa Mai Sun Po, which is the Chinese American morning paper. This was one of the first Chinese newspapers in the country. In 1904, Chinatown was visited by Dr. Sun Yat Sen as part of his global tour to get support for the Chinese Revolution. <laughs> and he would then go on to be the first president of the Republic of China. Yeah. He invited us to some parade or something. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. So, so, by, so by 1880, the Chinese population in L.A. was 1,169. Many more Chinese came to L.A. from San Francisco after the big earthquake in 1906. And by 1910, it was almost 3,000 Chinese people. At its peak between 1890 and 1910, Chinatown had spread across Alameda and took up 15 streets, 200 buildings. They had three temples. They had their own telephone system. There was even a Chinese opera house located between Ferguson Alley and March Assault Street. It was the largest Chinese community south south of San Francisco, but all things must pass. <laughs> Ironically, it was a railroad that shut down Chinatown. LA wanted to build a new station for the new railroad that was coming to town, a union station. <laughs> what do we call it though? <laughs> but what do we call it? Let's call it Displaced Chinese People Station. I like the ring of that. <laughs> they chose the location they did because it was right next to the Pueblo Plaza and they thought that that would help promote this weird new idea that they wanted to brand LA with of having this romantic Mexican Spanish past but still being really white. And, and also ignore all those Chinese people. Yeah. <laughs> so this was a chance for them to finally get rid of Chinatown or at least relocate it to a poorer part of the city so it wouldn't be such a central eyesore. There were disputes between the city and the Apoblasas and the Sepulvedas who owned the land that Chinatown was on. Mm -hmm. But on December 12, 1913, the Apoblasas sold their part of Chinatown for $310,000 to Southern Pacific Railroad. And on November 7, 1914, all the land east of Alameda was sold. And then on May 19, 19th, 1931, the courts approved moving forward with Union Station. The land sat for a little bit, but on the morning of December 23rd, 1933, the raising of Chinatown began. The Chinese were evicted from their properties, and since they couldn't own land and nobody wanted them, they didn't know where to go. They scattered around the city. Many of them moved to the city market area as mm -hmm. a haven. What was the old Chinatown is now 14 feet below the tracks of Union Station. In 1987, when they were building the underground metro, they uncovered covered a bunch of artifacts from Chinatown, oh, really? many of which can be seen at the Chinese American Museum at 425 North Los Angeles Street, which is off of the plaza at the end of Olvera Street. It's on the street that used to be the Calle, and it's in the last surviving structure of old Chinatown. All looks lost for the Chinese, but hope came in the form of an engineer from USC named Peter Suhu Jr., who convinced the city that the Chinese could own and maintain their own property and become a self-sufficient community, so he helped the community raise money to relocate to a new Chinatown. Take it, Greg! 